Well, good morning from my side. Um, as Brett said, my name's Justin Tamlin, and it really is a privilege to just gather together like this in freedom, to be able to open God's Word and to share it together. So the parables are tough. I was also saying to the team this morning, they said, how did 8 o'clock go? I said, I'm not sure I understand the parable. So uh, that's my disclaimer up front, but uh, I trust that I, I maybe understand it a little bit better than I did a week ago, and parables are like that. They're, they're a journey. So maybe you remember back to your childhood, or maybe you've got kids in your life, and you remember these words. That's not fair. That's not fair. She always gets to go first. Why did he get the biggest slice of cake? And we know our kids, they've got like these laser perfect eyes. Somehow, just by looking at two pieces, they're able to measure it, and what parent can cut a slice of cake absolutely perfect or dish the exact same volume of ice cream? It doesn't happen. You know, it's my turn to sit in the front. Even though my daughter and I has a driver's license, the, the two, of, two of my daughters were, were fighting last week when I had to take them somewhere about who should sit in the front. And uh, that's, that's just how life is. And, and maybe as we get older, uh, we're aware that in different, maybe more complex ways, we also say that's not fair. And we look at inconsistencies, you know. I get pulled over maybe by a cop, but what about that cop that just sped past me? He doesn't get uh, any, any repercussions for what he's done. So I think that's not fair is heard on the lips of infants, and it goes through life as we maybe face suffering, as we see people being blessed in ways that we feel we are not being blessed. And right up till we take that final breath, we find that even on the lips, those aged lips, of those who maybe even in those dying moments are shaking their fist in the face of God. So today's parable is going to expose our sense of fairness. And maybe you're going to read it and you're going to say, that's not fair. Uh, And it's our fairness as it relates to grace. So it's going to expose our understanding of grace. And so we're beginning a six-part series, and I've entitled it Parables, stories that read us. And so I'm hoping as we read this parable a little later that the parable will also read you and me. The gospel writers tell us that Jesus taught many things in parables. And so I wanna do a bit of an introduction before we get into the parable and I wanna ask, what is a parable? So here's the best definition that I have found by C.H. Dodd. He wrote this back in 1935 and he said, at its simplest, The parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into active thought. So let's unpack this definition briefly. And if you're in a community group, you're gonna be studying the parables, so I hope this will be helpful. And what's really great, Michael's put this together, and and you're gonna be studying six different parables. It's just so worked, the six he picked are not the six that I've picked, and so it's gonna be great. In the season, we get to cover 12 if you're in in a CG. But a parable is a comparison. That's the first part of the definition. It's an extended simile or metaphor. So if we look at the Greek word parable, it's two words, para, meaning alongside, and bole, from the the, the Greek verb balo, which means to throw. So if you do maths, a parabola is from the exact same word, para, bole. It means to throw alongside. So Jesus would be out, and he wants to teach a particular truth, and so next to that truth, he throws alongside that truth a parable. Or the parable itself is the truth, and he throws that down, and we're able to draw truth out of that parable. And so he wants to draw comparisons between earthly realities and kingdom realities. And we operate in this space, and this is what's familiar. And so it helps us to see this space here more clearly. If you remember back to your school days, a simile compares things using the terms like or as. That must be the English teachers that are here because the rest of you are thinking, I remember something like that back in high school. But many parables begin that way. The kingdom of heaven is like, dot, dot, dot. And maybe if you've been around church for a while, some of those parables have come back to mind. The kingdom of heaven is like, and one of my favorites, like treasure hidden in a field. I think that was the first sermon I ever preached here at Rosebank. Or the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took. And so there's different people. There's young and old, male and female. There's farmers and there's bakers. And and it's like, there's, there's an analogy there. There's an extended simile. But there's also parables that are more like metaphors. And they compare things without using like or as. And they just say things a little bit more directly. You are the salt of the earth. 
you are the light of the world, and I believe those are also parabolic sayings. But secondly, C.H. Dodd helps us see that a parable is true to life. It describes something new or something unknown in more familiar terms. So when you hear the words, a farmer went out to sow, or a fisherman went out to fish and he put that net in the water, or a master settled accounts, or a father had two sons, or a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers, we can all relate to that. It's, it's the air we breathe, it's familiar territory, it's Jesus taking what is familiar to help us to understand what is not familiar, that it's true to life. And while these stories are made up, they're not science fiction, they're not fantasy. No one's saying, sorry, what, what is that? A parable about a spaceship, never heard of that. No, no, these are things in everyday life. As someone once said, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And while a simplistic definition, I think that there's truth in that. Number three, a parable is arresting in its strangeness. So here we are this morning, we're going to be casually listening to Jesus' parable. Put yourself in the, in the shoes of the hearers of that day. They're just casually listening. Here's familiar things that we can taste, see, and touch. Characters, events. Jesus is a master storyteller, so we're being drawn into the story. We let our guard down. We enter in, and we feel all of the emotions. We begin to take sides and we say, oh, this is a horrible guy, or no, this is a great guy. We begin to make value judgments on the story, and then bam, the truth reads us. And in that moment, something happens. It's kind of like the punchline of a joke. You're going along and you're being sort of almost strung along with things that you think you know, and then the joke has an element of surprise because suddenly the things you've interpreted in this way are now slightly different and it causes a bit of humor. And while the parables aren't jokes in that sense that they're sort of a laugh a minute, there's some parables that that do have humor in, but there's more this element of surprise in which I liken it to the punchline of a joke. See, the story often doesn't end in the way we expect it. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the guy that we thought was the bad guy is actually the good guy. But yet, if we were the heroes of the day, we'd be saying, but, but I hate that guy, but actually, is the good guy, what's going on? And there's this surprise in the story. And when the lost son comes home, those people who were listening, they were waiting for the story. Here's a lost son, he's squandered the wealth, he has shamed the family, I know what's gonna happen. The father is, is surely gonna call all the neighbors together, they're gonna stone the son to death, they're gonna beat him, that's what this father's gonna do, I'm just waiting for this speech, I, I wanna feel the anger of the father. And you and I, the impact is lost because we know the story so well, but we look, there's the father running. What a father would never do in that day and age in public, lifting up his garments and running to his son, embracing him, getting ready to feast and to party. It's kind of the sting in the tail. Mary Ann Getty Sullivan in her book on the parables says the real teaching value of Jesus' parables can be seen in the twist. There is a gotcha or shocking element that suddenly strikes the audience. Some are put on the defensive, realizing as the story unfolds that their own presuppositions or biases or practices are being undermined. As a parable unfolds, hearers are likely to perceive the twist and beginning to anticipate its implications, try to avoid them with protests, indignation, and rejection. And so as you hear the parables in this series, you might say, yeah, no, sure, I'm entering in, and then suddenly there's this twist and you begin to get angry, Look at the Pharisees, they reacted so violently because they suddenly realized, that's me in the story. Oh, I don't like the way this is going. But number four, the parable is designed to evoke conversion. Parables are designed to prompt some kind of response. They're supposed to poke you and jab you in the ribs. C.H. Dodd said that they're there to tease the mind into active thought. And the parables reveal our hearts. They show, am I really aligned to God's kingdom? Am I really aligned to the gospel? Do I really believe the gospel? In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 13, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So as much as the parables reveal, they also conceal because why don't I understand this? It's because we don't understand the gospel. Everyone has ears, but not everyone understands the meaning of a parable. So before we jump into our parable, one last thing that I believe will be helpful for you is how do we interpret parables? Just very briefly. Because the parables are extended metaphors or similes, they usually have one main meaning. Now there are some that have 
some multiple meanings, but, but one main meaning. That's what we've got to go after. There's one thing that's actually being compared, and all the other details in the story are just supporting this one main idea. And we really are in danger of misinterpreting the parables if we use what's called an allegorical approach. Now, down through the centuries, that was the most popular way of interpreting the parables. It was looking at every little detail and saying, let's spiritualize this. What is this little detail? And what's this little detail? And some famous people, even like St. Augustine, did that. Let me give you an example. So you'd, if you were to turn to the Good Samaritan, the way you would interpret that allegorically is to say, well, you know, the Good Samaritan found this beaten up guy half dead on the side of the road, and he bandaged his wounds. So what are the bandages? The bandages is the word of God. And then he, he uh, uh, puts oil on his body. What is the oil? The oil is the Holy Spirit. And then he gives him wine. What's the wine? The wine is communion. So now you've got this picture. There he is on the road and he's serving him communion. And then he puts him on his own donkey. What do you think the donkey means? The donkey is the gospel. And the gospel carries him to the inn. And what's the inn? The inn is the church. And who's the innkeeper? Well, Augustus says the innkeeper is the apostle Paul. So how does, he, how does he do that? In fact, he's turned this into a prophetic passage that this is Apostle Paul and his ministry as the innkeeper. And actually the man that's lying in the road, he is Adam. And he's come from Jerusalem, which is heaven. And he's gone down to Jericho, which is this. And you can just see it goes on and on and on. It's missed the point because there's one main idea. Jesus is asked in the context by a lawyer, who is my neighbor? And Jesus could have just said, this is your neighbor, two-minute answer. But Jesus wants to draw him in and say, so tells the parable. So the one-man comparison is, who is my neighbor? We're going to be surprised that our neighbor is not the person we think. So we must find the main meaning in each parable. And I trust that they'll be helpful, particularly in your community groups. It is tougher than you think. Let me tell you that. So turn with me to our parable for this morning. Matthew chapter 20. It's on page 20 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 20 from verses 1 to 16. Now you may know that the headings in our Bibles are put there by the translators. The Bible is just one flowing um, book with our chapter numbers and verses. Uh, but the translators of the NIV, particularly in the Pew Bible, in front of you have called this parable the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Matthew chapter 20. So let's read the parable and let's allow the parable to read us. Let's look for the things that we've been saying. Let's look for the twist in the tale and allow God to challenge us. Here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, am I, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. 
Well, did you see how the parable started in verse one? There's our simile. The kingdom of heaven is like, it is like in this parable, a landowner who went out to find laborers for his vineyard. So this landowner, we can guess, is probably a wealthy man. You needed substantial uh, capital to be able to purchase uh, a vineyard. Uh, The text doesn't tell us, but my guess is that the time of year is probably September. Uh, And that's when grapes were harvested in Israel, particularly because after September, temperatures start to to plummet, Uh, the rains come, and so they've got to get the grapes harvested before the end of September. When I checked up on Google, the time of year in September in Israel, it's normally about 12 hours of daylight from about 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So you can just see the context of this parable. In the Galilee region where grapes were grown at this time, obviously today there's greater technology and they're able to grow them in some strange places and terrace things on the side of hills and all sorts of things. But in, in Galilee, the average temperature uh, in, 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 in uh, September, particularly as it moves up to some of the highs, is about 34 degrees Celsius. So you can see some of those highs in September uh, are, are pretty substantial. So the landowner himself goes out to look for some day laborers. Maybe this crop in this particular year was a bumper crop. Maybe he needed extra hands. We're not given those details in the story. And in some sense, they don't really matter what his reasons were. But he goes out just before sunrise. So this is just before 6 a.m. And he finds the unskilled day laborers there. I think maybe he went to build his warehouse on a Saturday morning and he went past the guys who were willing to paint and plumb and tile and all the rest and said, anybody here who can help me uh, harvest these grapes? And so he found these guys standing around looking for work. And then he speaks to them in verse 2 and tells them that he'll pay them a denarius for the day and they all agree to work for a denarius. In fact, maybe there's a hint that they were even quite encouraged by that, because a denarius was a very fair and reasonable wage, um, especially for an unskilled laborer. A skilled laborer, the going rate was a denarius a day. If you were a common soldier, you would have got a denarius a day. So for these guys, it was uh, not necessarily an out-of-the-world generous wage, but it was certainly more than, than what they would have been used to. I did some maths, and, uh, and I worked out that a denarius could buy two loaves of bread, per day for an individual for 10 days. So that'll give you an idea. So if you're a family, it probably could feed you uh, for a day, and that was the common diet. If you were an ordinary workman, you would have had a loaf for lunch and a loaf for supper, and that could buy two loaves for 10 days per day. So that just gives you an idea. And and, and these guys, without work, they're not gonna be able to support their families. They, They really appreciated a full day's work because that would bless their families, knowing that maybe there were others that weren't hired. And and, and so here they were with the blessing of a full day's wage. Simon Kistemacher in his commentary says, in Jesus' day, it was a privilege for the workman to be placed in a position to earn wages. By providing work for him, the employee showed him a measure of kindness. It was an act of grace on the part of the employer. So I don't want us to miss the grace that's even here in their hire and their appointments. And then a little later in verses three to four, the owner goes back to the marketplace at around 9 a.m. to look for more workers. And this time with these workers, he doesn't even discuss the wage that will be paid. Look at what he says. He merely says, I will pay you whatever is right. And they agree, they must know that he's a trustworthy employee, they're not questioning what they're gonna get paid, they know at the end of the day we'll get paid what's fair. But then as the day went on, perhaps the owner or the foreman began to crunch the numbers and realized, hang on a minute, we need to get these grapes out of the sun. Uh, I mean, uh, we we want them to be optimum. Maybe we've we've miscalculated how many workers we need. We need to go back and we need to find more. Maybe it was Friday. Maybe the Sabbath was coming. If you've been to Israel, you know that Sabbath officially starts when some particular first star comes out in the evening. And so with Sabbath, they needed to get it off. Every good grape farmer knows that that, that leaving the grapes when they ripened on the vine for even one day longer can heighten their sugar content, the value of the grapes can plummet, so there's a very small window of opportunity to harvest them. So in verse five, the landowner goes back now to find even more workers. He goes back at noon, he goes back at 3 p.m., we read. But then, quite astoundingly, we read, but late into the afternoon, they realize the job still cannot be completed without still more workers. So the owner goes one last time at 5 p.m., just an hour before sunset. 
And we read in verse 6 that he found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Now we don't know the reasons. Maybe the owner knew that, that the guys had been working the whole day, were running out of energy, the job still needed to be done, so fresh hands, you know, substitute player comes on the team and they're all bouncy and ready to go, and, and maybe that was his thought. Maybe he saw them and had compassion. Maybe he was a, a very empathetic owner and he reckoned, actually, these guys being hired for, for even the last hour is, is my grace to them. I mean, what can they really contribute? What are they really going to get done in the last hour? Pro- probably not much. And I mean, they've been hanging around the marketplace all day. And maybe it's compassion for their families. And think about it from their perspective. Maybe they'd stayed there just thinking, well, even a little bit of work would provide something. Maybe they'd stayed right to the end, which isn't normal. What day labor is still there at 5 p.m.? But their thought was, hey, if we could find an employee, maybe we can even set up work for tomorrow. At least I can go to sleep tonight with peace, knowing that at least tomorrow there'll be some bread on the table for my family. But I want you to see that the owner is the dominant figure in this parable. He's the one that goes to the marketplace. He's the one that enters into negotiations. He's the one that has discussions. He employs the workmen. He notices them. And in the opening verse, verse 1, he's the one to whom the kingdom of heaven is compared. And so perhaps it would be better to title this parable the parable of the owner of the vineyard. Yes, the parable of the workers and the wages helps us to remember what it is, but it's supremely actually about the owner. So the owner at the end of the day asks his foreman to call the workers and to pay them their wages. The Old Testament stipulated in Leviticus 19 and verse 13, do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. The Old Testament stipulated in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 14, do not take advantage of a hired man who's poor and needy. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you'll be guilty of sin. So the owner wants to be fair. He wants to uphold the the Old Testament laws. He wants to pay his laborers at the end of the day before sunset. But he has just one further request to the foreman in verse 8. And maybe it's a strange one. He says, pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And so we read in verse 9. The workers who were hired about 5 p.m. came and each received a denarius. Now let's just let that strike you. If you were the employer, and some of you are employers, some of you work in HR, what would you have paid the 5 p.m. laborers who maybe did an hour's work at best? Well, this owner is incredibly generous. He pays a full day's wage for one hour's work. That is incredible. I mean, it would be the equivalent in our society of a car guard going on duty at Crest the shopping mall at 11 p.m. And he goes to like that far corner where all the shops are closed. Maybe there's one restaurant there that doesn't even really do well. There's actually only one couple in there, but he starts work at 11 p.m. And it's, it's kind of almost time to knock off. The restaurant closes at 11 anyway. And here comes this couple out of the restaurant. I mean, can he expect to earn the same as his colleagues who've been there on a Saturday morning with all the shoppers throughout the heat of the day? And and then here comes this couple. And instead of giving giving him a five rand tip, they put a 50 rand note in his hand. I mean, it's like, wow. Uh, Maybe that's what these guys felt like. And here's where the parable hinges. Here's the twist, the punchline, the kind of hit you between the eyes surprise. It's in verse 10. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. In fact, one commentator says verse 10 is the key to interpret the parable. He says those hired first thought, they thought they would receive more. The parable breaks any chain of logic connecting reward, hard work, and human perceptions of what is right. That chain, that link, that causal relationship is gonna be broken. Here it is. Those who had worked since 6 a.m. were standing there and they began to calculate. You can see them. You would be doing the same thing. We're going to get proportionally more. This is incredible. I don't know if this guy's nuts, but he's basically changed the terms and conditions. He is paying a daily wage per hour. 
12 times the going rate we're going to get. We've, we've worked 12 times harder. And so look at the end of verse 10. But each one of them also received a denarius. Sorry, what, Justin? Each one of them also received a denarius. What? Sorry, let me see that payslip. That's not my payslip. What? And look at verse 11. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. They were upset. And they shouted, that's not fair. The word for grumble in the Greek is an onomatopoeic kind of word. It's ego gogudzon, from the, the, the verb gogusmos. You can hear it. Gogusmos, gogusmos, ego gogudzon, ego gogudzon. And, and, and they're working themselves out, up. And then they put forward their case in verse 12. These men who were hired last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. We've worked 12 times longer in far more difficult conditions. Do you know how hot 34 degrees Celsius is? We felt the burden of the work. We felt the sun on us. We have broken the back of this vineyard. I mean, these guys walk in here and and basically they, they pick one last grape. That's not fair. That's not fair. And Jesus, the master storyteller, knows that you and I feel some natural sympathy for them. Do you agree with me? As you hear the story, something just doesn't feel right. It's starting to play with our views of justice and what is fair, and is grace actually fair, or maybe grace is actually unfair, and maybe it's supposed to be that way, and what is justice, and what is what I deserve, and what are my rights? But the economy of God's kingdom is not the economy of man's kingdom. That's the point. The kingdom of heaven is based on grace and the kingdom of man is based on merit. It is injected into us from the time we can walk. You are great and you deserve great things and earn your way to the top of the ladder. It's in our DNA. In the real world, who would ever think it's fair to pay workers who'd worked one hour the same as workers who'd paid 12 hours? HR departments would have all sorts of precedent problems. If an employee ever did such a thing, even if he chose to, he would have kept it hidden. But this was announced publicly, and that's Jesus' genius. He wants to say, hey, here are everybody's pay slips. They're on the table. Come into my office. You don't even have to look and sort of see, ooh, there they are. There's everyone's pay slips. But you see, this is not a parable about fair labor laws. It's not a parable about minimum wages. It's not a parable about how to run a business. It's a parable about how grace works in God's kingdom. And Terry Johnson in his book on the parable says, the genius of this parable is in its capacity to uncover our confusion about grace and our self-righteousness. Our confusion about grace and our self-righteousness. You see, as you feel these emotions, that's what Jesus wants you to feel. Our problem is that we think we have earned grace. All of us today would say, of course, theologically, I don't believe that, but in our hearts we do. When we suffer and we see others that don't suffer, when we feel I've been an elder in this church for 20 years and why has God not answered that prayer? When a friend of ours gets cancer, but our rude, cranky neighbor is living into his 90s and he's the person that nobody ever wants to deal with and nothing's ever happened to him and dictators in the world lead into their 90s, but dear people in the prime of life who loved God and wanted to be missionaries are snuffed out. You you see, all of this reveals that we turn grace into self-righteousness. We think, but I wanna pat myself. And we forget what grace was like initially because as we get on the Christian road, it's like, yeah, I needed grace to start, but now it's really my works that keep me going. Now, Now God's in my debt. And so if we were in a Bible study together, I'd ask you at this point, is the landowner unfair? So ask yourself that, is the land owner unfair? Well, in verse 13, the landowner answers one of them. He addresses it to one of them, and he says, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? So he even calls him friend. He's even expressing warmth in the midst of this grumbling and this backlash. Did, did the landowner keep his end of the agreement? Yes or no? Yes. Did they receive exactly what they had agreed to work for? Yes. 
to the letter. The owner did nothing wrong. He committed no injustice. That's what they had agreed. In fact, at the time, they were probably excited because it was more than the going rate. Uh, they had work for the day. They could provide for their families. So he gave them exactly what he promised. But I think that's the problem with us. We notice grace at first, but once life gets harder and we work through the heat of the day, then something happens when we look at other people, not ourselves, but what God does for other people. And they forgot that those others who came in late perhaps also deserved a living wage. Perhaps they too wanted to provide for their families. Leon Morris says, I think so helpfully in his commentary on Matthew. He says, the fact that the landowner chose to be generous to other people gave these men no new rights. Their discontent was due to envy, not to the overlooking of any of their rights. And that's what happens with us. Our envy is exposed when God seems to bless others and it seems to us as though we've got the raw end of the deal because if we're operating on a system of works, then why should I have got a raw deal when I have been performing and they have not been performing? We also find our envy exposed when others that we deem are undeserving of grace, God lavishes them with grace. That's what the story of Jonah is about. This could be the parable of Jonah. Jonah is like, I'm not going to Nineveh because I know you're a gracious God. I hate those people. I don't like them. They should be judged. And so I'm not sharing the gospel because if I go and share the gospel, I know that you're a holy God, but also a loving God who will forgive them. And so eventually Jonah does, and what happens? I told you so, you see God, you've been gracious, and I don't think they deserve grace. And so he sits under that tree that God makes grow up, and then when the tree withers, what does Jonah say? I'm angry enough to die. And God says, but didn't I provide this tree? Isn't that my mercy and grace? No, I deserved it. And the story kind of ends. I think that's a picture of what's going on here. And maybe you see it in deathbed conversions. How do you feel about the thief on the cross? He didn't have a chance to to go to the taste of RUC. He didn't have a chance to join a CG. He didn't have a chance to audition for the worship team. He was hanging, dying on a cross. And Jesus said, my grace is sufficient because today you will be with me in paradise. How do we feel when we compare that with Peter, James, and John and the other disciples who'd served, who'd been martyred, who'd had to stand up for their faith, who who had a tough time? If that offends you in some way, maybe you've misunderstood grace. Because do you see how deep Jesus' teaching goes? It uncovers hidden motives, exposes our misunderstanding, not only of grace, but of works. And so the landowner says in verse 14, take your pay and go. Look what he says, he says, I want to give the man. He says, I want to give, not merely pay him, I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And that's a challenging question. Because God is God and I'm not. So I wanna answer that question for God, but God comes back and says, Justin, church, Don't I have the right to do with my money as I please? Johnson says in his commentary, God is not obligated to bless all or give to all. If he blesses and gives to one and not another, it is his right. This is challenging. That's what Paul writes to the Romans. Romans 9 verse 14. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Romans 9, 18. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. Romans 9, 21. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? That's challenging because it challenges our worldview because none of us deserve grace. You can't earn grace. You can't merit grace. If you could, it wouldn't be grace. It would just be a wage that you paid. If God was only just and fair, we'd all get hell. That is sobering. 
We want to say, God, you're unjust. I want you to be fair. If God was fair, he would wipe us all out because we are sinners in the presence of a holy God. The only thing that sustains us, the only thing that keeps your heart going, the only thing that keeps the brainwaves firing is his grace and his mercy to you in these moments. Because God is more than fair. If he was just, only just, and only fair, oh, what we truly would deserve would be far worse than we think, but we don't like to think that way because we think we're better than we are in God's sight. He's more than fair. He's generous and he's gracious to whosoever he wishes. And so verse 15, he says, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? The Greek literally says, And this has come into our English language from the King James Version. The Greek literally says, or is your eye evil? Do you have an evil eye? I don't know what an evil eye looks like, but an evil eye is jealous and it is covetous. Is your eye evil because I'm generous? The owner's generosity is what exposed their envy. They'd been happy up until that point. They were happy with the grace they'd been given until they saw the grace given to others. And God's generosity transcends our ideas of fairness. No one receives less than what they deserve, but some receive far more. Just hear that again. No one in the story received less than they deserve, but some received far more. Todd Freeman, who's a pastor, writes, grace is the great equalizer that strips away our presumed privilege and entitlement. And boy, are we a privileged and entitled people at times. God's grace puts all recipients on an even playing field. That's hard to stomach when we have burdened ourselves with a merit system, wanting to see some extra reward or bonus for all our labors and hard work. This parable completely turns our view of grace and works upside down. And that's why if you look, look back at chapter 19 and verse 30, how this parable is bracketed, and you'll see how I've illustrated it on the screen. It's bracketed at the beginning, in chapter 19 and verse 30, and remember that there were no chapter headings, so that was the springboard for this parable when Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first, and then he jumps into the parable, And then he ends the parable in chapter 20 and verse 16, so it's sandwiched between these brackets. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's why this parable is here. It's a reversal of all our earthly principles. And I encourage you, go home and read chapter 19. We don't have time to unpack the wider context. It is astounding what's just taken place in chapter 19 that's led to this parable. And it's astounding that the disciples still don't get it after this parable in chapter 20 because mommy dearest is coming with her sons of Zebedee and saying, please, I want this one to be first and where will they sit in your kingdom? And just look at where this parable is placed. The kingdom of God completely reverses the order of what we expect. Those who came last do not get one twelfth of grace, they get all of grace, all the same grace that those who came first get. So can I kind of give you just maybe a bulleted list of some things that we can learn from this parable? And maybe some of these will resonate with you more than others, but one main meaning, but many applications. We learn from this parable that salvation is not earned, no one can boast boast that that they earned grace. It's a gift. God gives the same grace to all who follow Christ no matter where they started. Sorry, no matter when they started. God's treatment of people is not based on human standards of fairness. We learn that God initiates salvation. He's the one going out into the marketplace. He's the one calling and looking. We learn that God continues to call people into his kingdom at different times. Some people come young in life. Some people come late in life. Spurgeon did a whole sermon, which I think is maybe taking things a bit far, but he looked at each season of life and how that corresponded to the different hours and youth and teenage and adult life. Some have said, well, those who came early were the Jews who had to bear the burden of the law of the day and, and, and work through that, and then there was the Gentiles that come later. I think that's maybe pushing the text a bit far. But some of you have come as young people, and some of you have come later in life. I think we learn that God calls sinners to his kingdom 
who are not self-sufficiently employed in other things. If you're not standing in the marketplace, if you haven't recognized your desperate need of of a savior, and and you're off sorting out your own life of self-sufficiency, well then you don't need an employer. I learned that God always keeps his promise. I learned that God always gives us more than we deserve. I learned that God is gracious and we should learn to celebrate with others. Isn't that the story of the prodigal son? Isn't the, aren't these two stories inseparably linked? The older son is not happy with the grace that's shown to somebody, his younger son, that he thinks doesn't deserve it, and he will not celebrate. I learned that we are prone to resent those who we think shouldn't get grace. I learned that we are prone to compare ourselves to others and envy what they have received. And I learned that we are prone to moan about our lot in life when we compare ourselves to others. Woe is me, why did you give me this lot when I look at others that are, their marriage is flourishing and their business is flourishing and their children haven't gone off the rails. Why me, Lord? It's challenging. But I wanna close and say, what if you looked at this parable through the eyes of those who are hired last? Because if you do, you'll recognize that it costs the landowner to be generous. He's the one that actually paid the cost. No one was concerned about his rights. But when you look at his rights, he didn't have to do this. And it cost him. What normal employee would do that? They'd go bankrupt after a couple of days of harvest. And yet that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He bankrupted himself when he went to the cross. He paid that great cost. And you got grace. And that is unfair. That is unjust. That he who was rich became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. This parable just shatters and blows apart our understanding of God, of grace, of works. And so I want to challenge you. Thank God every day that he's not just fair. Thank him for his grace and his mercy to you that he found you when he did. And when you find jealousy rearing its ugly head, just remind yourselves, Lord, I actually don't deserve anything. This could be the best day right now in this moment because I don't know what tomorrow could bring. I live in a fallen world. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. There could be tragedy and trauma. This could be the best day I have now and that will be because of your grace and my appreciating today, Lord. And then to any of you here this morning who might still be standing out in the marketplace, You're on the outside looking and you're waiting. You sense that there's more to life than what you've found. And who knows if you only have one hour of opportunity left. None of us know when we'll pass away. I think of a man that passed away right outside this fence here. In the traffic, two weeks ago, as he was having that heart attack, I assume managed to just pull his bucky one wheel off on the pavement and that's where his body was for five or six hours. As I went out and met his wife and met his children, and as the traffic was just going past, everyone on their daily business, here was somebody on the way to the meeting, his business partner arrived, just been speaking to him on the phone, gone. None of us know when that time is, and Jesus comes to you at what could be your 11th hour, and he says, why are you still hanging around the marketplace? And perhaps it's time for you to be honest for the first time this morning. Maybe you've been here feeling like you're on on the outskirts of the marketplace, but you've never accepted the job offer. Maybe it's time to be honest and say, no one has hired me. I'm not wanted. I don't belong. I'm lacking a purpose. My future seems utterly bleak. If I'm honest, I cannot even lift a finger to provide for myself salvation. Well, then Jesus says to you, come. Come into my vineyard. Come and experience my generous provision. Come and I will fill your empty soul and your searching heart with grace and with my presence. Let's pray together.